What does gravity look like? To you, it might look like the arced flight of a baseball or leaves falling from trees. What does gravity look like for something really, really big, like black holes on the other side of the universe? We can't see them, so how do we know they're there? Gravitational waves are deformations in the fabric of space-time emanating from the movement of some of the most massive objects in the universe. But gravitational waves are not a type of light, and therefore they're invisible to the human eye, which makes it really hard to imagine how they work. So today, we're going to gain some understanding about how gravitational waves work and how we measure them that you'd otherwise only get by taking a class in general relativity. We're going to do it by harnessing the power of dance. But before we put on our dancing shoes, we have to take a step back and talk about general relativity. Einstein's theory of general relativity describes gravitation as the curvature of space-time. Fortunately, we can talk about gravitational waves just by talking about changes in the shape of space. Space is three-dimensional. A dimension just describes a direction an object can move, like forward back, left right, and up down. To make things easier, let's start by just talking about two dimensions, forward back and left right. Welcome to our 2D universe. Objects in this 2D universe can move anywhere along this grid. They can move forward backward, they can move left right, or they can move some combination of the two. Every being that lives in this universe is stuck on this grid. And fundamentally, objects with mass, like a planet, for example, warp this grid. If we introduce another massive object into this universe, like a moon, its path is bent toward the planet. General relativity tells us that this deflection of objects away from straight paths due to the curvature of space-time is the true definition of gravity. To summarize general relativity in two sentences, matter tells space-time how to curve, and the curvature of space-time tells matter how to move. A planet might deform space-time like this, but the amount of curvature depends on the mass of the object. So a star, which is much more massive, will warp space-time even more. But a black hole will pinch space-time to an infinitesimal point so drastically that not even light can escape. Now, before we start making gravitational waves in our 2D universe, we need to talk about one more property of space-time. Both our universe and this 2D universe have a speed limit. That speed limit is the maximum speed at which information can travel. The speed of information in our universe is about 300 million meters per second. You and I and everything we interact with on a daily basis travels way slower than that speed limit. Some things, like light, travel at that speed limit, which is why the speed of information is sometimes referred to as the speed of light. Gravitational waves also travel at that speed. We can see the consequences of this by suddenly introducing a black hole into our 2D universe. If we pause for a moment, even though this black hole exists in its part of the universe, I, as a being living on this 2D fabric, am still not aware that it exists, because the warping of space-time is traveling out from the source at the speed of information, and the news about that black hole hasn't reached my region of space yet. Only now do I feel its presence. The fact that information doesn't travel instantaneously between two distant parts of the universe is what allows gravitational waves to exist. Without the information speed limit, there would be no gravitational waves. But black holes don't just appear out of thin air. 
but we do sometimes find them orbiting other black holes. This configuration of two massive objects orbiting each other is known as a binary system. And when a binary system of black holes orbits near the speed of information, they produce detectable gravitational waves. Let's take a moment to discuss some properties of not just gravitational waves, but waves in general. Let's just say, for the sake of explanation, that each of these squares is one light year on a side. That is, the distance that light and gravitational waves can travel in one year. One fundamental property of waves is the wavelength. Very simply, wavelength is the distance between consecutive peaks of the wave. If each square is one light year, and the peaks of these waves are two squares apart, we would say that these gravitational waves have a wavelength of two light years. Another fundamental property of waves is the frequency. The frequency of a wave is the number of wavelengths that pass a region of space per unit time. Since we know the wavelength is two light years, and we know that gravitational waves are traveling at the speed of light, we can easily figure out the frequency. Let's count how long it takes one wavelength to pass by this region of space. So we'll start with zero years as the first peak passes this point, and count until the next peak passes. Ready, go. It takes one year to travel one light year, and two years to travel two light years. Since one wave passes this point every two years, we would say that the frequency of these gravitational waves is one per two years. The frequency of gravitational waves depends on how fast these black holes are orbiting each other. If the orbital rate of the black holes increases, the frequency of gravitational waves increases. Notice that even though the black holes are orbiting faster, the waves aren't moving faster. They still obey the speed limit. There are just more waves passing in the same amount of time. A ramp up in the gravitational wave frequency is characteristic of the in spiral of black holes and is responsible for the chirp of gravitational waves associated with observed black hole mergers. Still, we've not quite gotten to the full picture of how gravitational waves distort spacetime. That's because we're still stuck in this simplified 2D universe. So let's step up by one dimension and see how gravitational waves distort the three dimensions of space. The way I'm going to illustrate that is with a dance. You can uh, join me in the dance if you want to. So I want you to imagine that a gravitational wave is passing from behind me, through my body, and out of your computer screen. So the gravitational wave is moving in the forward back direction. And I'm out here floating in space, and my body is oriented in the up, down, and left, right directions. So we have this new added direction, this third direction of up, down. So what's going to happen to my body when the gravitational wave passes through it? Well, when the peak of the wave passes, I'm going to get tall and skinny. And then when the trough of the wave passes, I'm going to get short and fat. Peak of the wave, tall and skinny. Trough of the wave, short and fat. Tall and skinny, short and fat. Tall, skinny, short and fat. This is the way that gravitational waves warp the three dimensions of space in the directions perpendicular to the way the wave is traveling. Peak of the wave, tall and skinny, trough, short and fat. So the gravitational wave is moving in the forward back direction and my body is being warped in the up, down and left, right directions. Gravitational waves are not just distorting one point in space. They're distorting all points simultaneously along the path of the wave, like this. Each dancer is representing what's happening to space 
at a different point along the path of the wave. The peak of the wave passes a dancer and he gets tall and skinny. The trough of the wave passes and he gets short and fat. But while one dancer is getting tall and skinny, another is getting short and fat. The distortions are different along different points of the wave. But the thing I really want you to notice is that these dancers are not moving forward and backward as the gravitational wave passes. They're not riding the wave. Nor are they getting fatter and skinnier in the direction the wave is traveling. That's because gravitational waves distort space in the directions perpendicular to the direction the wave is traveling. So the wave is traveling in the forward-back direction, and the dancers are shrinking and expanding in the up-down and left-right directions. While I'm only showing the distortion in one direction, in reality, it propagates out in all directions, away from the binary system, stretching and shrinking everything as it passes, stars, planets, solar systems, galaxies, and us. The goal of gravitational wave astronomy is to measure the motion of the dance, the expanding and shrinking of space perpendicular to the direction of wave travel. Remember, the amount of stretching of space-time is related to the mass of the objects in the binary system, and the frequency of the waves they produce is related to the orbital frequency of the binary. So by measuring the magnitude and frequency of these distortions, we can understand the binary systems that generated these gravitational waves. So how do we measure it? In the next video, we'll talk about how astronomers made an exciting new discovery using a gravitational wave telescope the size of the galaxy. If you don't want to miss it, make sure you subscribe and click the notification bell. Until then, thanks for watching. This video was made possible thanks to Nanograv, a physics frontier center of the National Science Foundation.